So, hi everybody, I'm Kees-Jan de Vries. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Booking.com and I do owe an apology for everybody who came here to hear about fraud. The title of my uh, presentation is Building a Real-Time Fraud Prevention Engine Using Open Source uh, Big Data Software. Now, if you just cross through the fraud prevention and just make a prediction, then you're in the, the right room. Sorry? Uh, the title is a fraud, basically, yeah. So I, I thought that this was a slide that everybody would be presenting, like, who am I? Uh, but apparently, I haven't seen one uh, before. But uh, I, I'm Kaysen Nafriis. I did a PhD in physics at Imperial College. And uh, <laughs> nice. Um, since then, I've joined Booking.com, and I've been there for one and a half years now. Um, I'm in the security department uh, fighting fraud. Um, and here's my LinkedIn details. I'm not going to read out. Oh, actually, Booking.com. Who knows Booking.com? Hands. Who has ever booked a room with Booking.com? OK, great. Who, who has never used Booking.com? All right, guys, you, you, you know what you're going to do. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was nice to also put some stats there, but uh, yeah, you can read it in your spare time. OK, so um, what I'll be going through is some of the motivation, like what do we do at Booking uh, Security Fraud? Uh, but also, like, the main reason for this uh, presentation, which is you build your awesome uh, model and then you want to deploy it in real time, and that's when... Uh, here's where I want to share some of the lessons learned. So what I'm going to be doing is quite the opposite of what everybody uh, seems to be doing here, which is I'm going to just propose to you, like, a running example, um, the uh, probability to book a room given uh, that you look on the hotel page. And I'm going to uh, highlight some features that you could use, uh, hypothetically, um, and then how you build the aggregate features um, in, in real time, um, how you do the model training and deployment, and uh, also something about the interpretation of results. And this is something that was already mentioned in the um, keynote presentation this morning about, by uh, RISE Labs. So I think it uh, could be interesting. All right, so first up, this is Booking.com, beautiful website. Um, so I'm just uh, showing you what, what would happen if you look for hotels in Boston around this time of, uh, of year. Um, so where we come in, uh, Booking.com has this great mission of empowering people to uh, discover, experience the world. Um, if I'm in the security department there. We really want to just provide a secure reservation system to, to allow, uh, to, to facilitate all of these hundreds of thousands of bookings uh, made on a daily basis. And in the fraud prevention, we want to protect the customers and the property partners, uh, basically hotel uh, owners, um, ensuring that everybody has the best possible experience. But what I'm going to talk about today uh, is like you go from training your awesome model to serving it in real time uh, at low latency using uh, aggregate features. And this aggregate features thing, I also haven't really seen much of it like uh, concrete in, in the previous talks. All right, so here's the running example. What I hope you take away from this going and take that with you in the rest of the presentation is like, when do we want to predict um, and uh, what um, yeah, three of the main features that I'll be uh, using. So a disclaimer, although it looks realistic what I'm doing here, it's not necessarily, uh, it's actually necessarily not um, uh, one of the things that we do. So it's just an example of how you could use machine learning, but it's, it highlights some of the most important, the things I want to talk about. Okay, so back to my example. Uh, I want to book a hotel in uh, Boston for the Spark Summit, and I type in the uh, the Boston and uh, also the check-in, check-out date. Then I get to see the page that shows like a list of uh, hotel options. And um, for the sake of the argument, I'm just going to click on the first hotel. Uh, and, that, and when you do that, you basically get to see some information about the hotel. And uh, yeah, but I decide to uh, look at a few others as well. Okay, so. Let's now assume that we want to help the customer make the uh, best choice. Then uh, what we're going to do, and now you have to uh, listen very carefully, the moment that someone clicks 
on the, one of the hotels, we want to calculate what is the probability that, like, being on this on this page, uh, what is the probability that someone actually books? Okay, so that's that's the predictive model that we're going to uh, have a look at. And the way that would look is like this: so you click, and then you go to your prediction engine, and then maybe you show some uh, really uh, interesting ad or whatever. Uh, you do some uh, follow-up action. So this should look familiar because this is basically the slide that uh, the Rise Lab was also presenting this morning. Okay, so um, again, someone clicks on the website, uh, on, oh, sorry, on the hotel, um, on, the, on that hotel uh, thing, and then comes to the uh, hotel page. So uh, the labels that we're going to consider is, did this person book, yes or no? given that they were on that hotel page. And the features that I'm going to propose to you is like, well, you could look, look at the time of day, but what I'm really interested in is like, okay, let's build a profile around this user. So uh, there's something that you know about the user, uh, him or herself, but there's also circumstantial things that you might know about um, the user or like just, because sometimes it might be a completely new user and you, never, you just don't know anything about him. Oh, yeah. so, here are the three examples. I'm gonna um, really look, like, go through these and how you would build them. First up is the distinct number of hotels viewed in the last 30 minutes. Second one is for, the, for this user, how many bookings has he or she made uh, so far? And then for the hotel page, what is the uh, rate of bookings uh, per, per view in the last three months? Okay. So, and then in high level, what we're gonna step through is like you have um, features in real time, uh, your model, and then the action. And the features, I'm gonna argue like this, you wanna use like some sort of lookup. Um, and that's happening behind the scenes. Okay, so taking the running example uh, forward, we're gonna have a look at how do we do that. So, the way it looks, the way the data, data looks is like this. You have um, the request to the engine coming in here, and um, they come in uh, in time. And simultaneously, they generate ex as well um, data that you might want to aggregate over. For example, the distinct number of hotels that the person has viewed. So every time you click on a hotel, like you generate also a data point. Um, and here are the reservations, so maybe this this hotel view actually re resulted in a reservation. Okay, so a reminder of the fe features that we're going to build. And uh, let's have a look at the first one. So now I'm flipping the axis. Uh, time is now in the horizontal, horizontal di direction. The requests to the engine are in this uh, green bar and they just make like stripes. And if you look carefully, like below, the same uh, clicks actually, they uh, I split them out by, by user. Now, um, what's interesting about this particular feature is that you're going to look at the number of distinct hotels in the last 30 minutes. So I'm trying to depict that with this blue box um, that, that shows that it's a small time window. Now, um, another thing that I want to stress is this data source coincides with the, with the request to the engine. So you literally want to know, okay, is this a new hotel or not? Because that, that helps you count the distinct number of, of hotels. Um, and um, what you will also notice is that this is a small time window, right? So we, we, we've seen like you want to have like the entire history in some cases, but in this case, we're only looking at the last 30 minutes. So with that in mind, um, you can consider looking at complex event processing in memory. And um, I put up one of the technologies out there. There's, uh, there's more, uh, but in, in, uh, with, with Esper, you can, do, you can write a query like this, select count distinct hotel ID from clicks over time window of 30 minutes, group by user. And it just sits there waiting for an event to come in and it immediately uh, pops out uh, the aggregation. And so I feel that this is where it's very different from uh, Spark streaming, where you have like streaming and like you, you, something goes in, a, st a stream of data goes, goes in and a stream of data comes out. 
Um, I thought it was nice to put some, oh, before I go there. So the, the, for me, the big thing is like you have no lag in the um, um, aggregation. It is, however, not persistent, right? This, when uh, the node goes down or so, then you, yeah, you need to, uh, you, you lost also the information. But it's only for 30 minutes, so maybe that's something you can live with. Or So um, you might wonder, okay, how fast is this then? Uh, so this is information from the Esper website. So complex event processing and Esper are standing queries and latency uh, to the answer is usually below um, 10 microseconds with more than 99% predictability. So I think that's reasonably, if you want that sort of performance, then this is probably the way to go. Um, and also the first component of scaling, yeah, question about scaling, like how, how well does it scale? The first component is that uh, the throughput can be achieved on running a single, uh, single node. Um, so for Asper, they claim that it's between uh, 10,000 uh, 10, and 200,000 events per second. Okay, next up. Now we're going to look at this feature, the number of bookings made so far. So this is a completely different game, right? You see that the, the aggregation window is whatever, all of time, and now you're hit by something really different, which is that like all of these um, users come into play. So depending on the cardinality of the number of users that you have, you might really need like a huge database, um, and you might actually need to go to uh, tools like, uh, like Cassandra or, or other key, key value stores. Something that's distributed, something that you can write to and, and uh, read from, um, something that scales. So one thing that I do want to uh, re-emphasize is that like, uh, yes, very scalable and persistent, that's nice. Um, however, this, this feature, this like, uh, thing that you have like really instant aggregations, you kind of lose it because you cannot, you cannot expect like, the update to happen in a few um, microseconds, right? That's just not going to happen. And also put in brackets like uh, Kafka and uh, Spark Streaming, the, the way you, in which you could make this thing close to real time but not exactly real time. And then some things from the website about uh, Cassandra. All right, so the last thing is um, the, um, on the hotel page, so more like the circumstantial features. So here's like the, um, how I want to depict this. Basically, you have more events, and uh, you have more booking and click events coming in, but you also have less um, hotels, hopefully, <laughs> than, than users, right? So um, in that case, you, and also given that you go over um, a three months period, maybe it is good enough for you to do just batch processing, maybe run a nightly job or, yeah. Or you go, or you just do the uh, Spark streaming thing, but in principle, the, the cardinality might be uh, medium or just a, a low. And um, yeah, if you're really interested in the last three months, I don't know if the last few hours really matter. So maybe, maybe you find it does. And in that case, you just you can get away with just doing a, a Hive query, putting it in um, MySQL or any other of your um, favorite database. And I think this is how people always used to do it. Okay, so done with the features. And uh, now we want to deploy our model. And I think this is also a big pain point for a lot of people. Like you have your uh, nice Spark ML uh, algorithm, and then how am I going to serve that? So, um, but before we go there, just a quick word on how you would, yeah, you need to obviously uh, construct the, the, these aggregate features, and you need to kind of go in the time machine and uh, rewind the, the, the clock, right? How, what did the reality look like at the time? And you'll uh, need to make queries like this, uh, just for every request that you get, you want to just f calculate those aggregations um, from, uh, uh, from your data source. And what I think when you do this, this is more like a technical um, thingy, like as a data scientist, you need to do this homework. What I recommend you do is really think in terms of requests and uh, events and keep, the keep them um, separate, at least conceptually. And this is a query of how you could do it. Um, 
very simple. You join the events on the, if you look at the user ID, you just join it on the user ID. Um, you group by a request ID, and then you make a where statement that, of your time window, and, and that's it. But uh, if you, you will find that if you do this on a hotel level or so, then um, yeah, you might encounter um, stragglers, and then you need to use your best uh, Spark skills to uh, make it all happen. I think that's a reality that a lot of people are in. Okay, so you've, you, ha you now have your uh, features and some labels, and now you're gonna do some model training. So let's say you use uh, H2O. I, I'm go on the next slide, I will be talking a little bit more about H2O, but H2O is basically um, an um, in, in memory distributed uh, uh, machine learning library, and they provide, among other things, that, uh, good implementations of models, but the most important thing I'll, I'll show in uh, a few slides. So you train your model, um, you evaluate it using uh, whatever, your metric, evaluation metrics, and then you investigate, okay, can I improve this model? Maybe you need to do some hyperparameter tuning, maybe you want to do some more feature engineering, maybe some fe feature selection, and then, Um, yeah, and so, but one of the most important things, I think, is that this process is not uh, slow and painful. You want to have something that's fast. Um, just some nice, some nice benchmark that H2O did. Um, so they took a billion rows and uh, they tested logistic regression. And um, I think they have 12 features, three of which are categorical. Uh, nine of which are uh, numerical features, and here are the uh, training times that it took for, um, and the iterations, number of iterations. I mean, five seconds to go over a billion rows, that's nice. Um, I, we did some uh, benchmarking and we found similar uh, numbers. So more benchmarks are, uh, you can find in these links and more information about HO. But now comes the, the, the biggest selling point, I think. So you have your model, you train it using your data frames or whatever. You've done all of the uh, ETL in, in Spark. And then when you're done, you do download Pojo. And what that means, Pojo means plain old Java object. And so you extract your model and make it into compilable Java. And you can run it on your um, JVM. And I think that's awesome. That solves the entire problem of like, uh, wanting to deploy a model that you train, and, like you spend so much time doing that, and this is really like here, uh, over to the developers, and off you go. Okay, so switching gears, another uh, thing that I think is, is nice and also a requirement uh, maybe these days and going forward is that you want to uh, give in a score, you want to say why was the score so high or low or whatever. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, the two favorite algorithms. Um, in the case of log logistic regression, you, uh, you know that the score is just a sigmoid function of uh, this here, um, a weight factor, um, the inner product with a feature factor, so you basically have the weight times the feature plus uh, feature one plus another weight times the feature two. And actually it's not so hard to see what really contributed to uh, high or low scores. It's just feature one contributed by this amount, just the weight times feature one, and, uh, and so on. So if you want to show like what is the most contributing one, you just take the highest. For a random forest, it's a little bit more uh, tricky, so I'm completely following this, um, this blog post. If you type in Google um, random forest interpretation, then you, you'll find this blog post. So um, but let's, start from one, let's start from one uh, decision tree. So uh, we, have, we have a bunch of internal nodes, um, and on every internal node, you have a feature and a, a value that you're comparing it against. And you also have the probability of uh, the class that you're trying to predict. So you go left or right, um, and you, you eventually you get into uh, leaf nodes, and that's your left with, your prediction is basically the probability there. Now you could argue, okay, uh, let's say I'm in this, 
in this leaf note here, actually, I did see feature uh, 15. I did see feature 2, and now I'm here. So you connect, well, it's, it's not perfect maybe, but you can say, okay, the way this, I'm going to interpret this course, you go from probability P0 to P1 because of feature uh, 15. So you could say that just the difference is the, is the contribution of feature 15. And the same, and likewise, going from P1 to P3, that's the contribution that you get from uh, feature 2. Now, obviously, this is a very shallow tree. You could build much deeper trees, and you can average over all of your trees in your random forest, but that's, uh, that's definitely a, a way of interpreting the contribution from your uh, score. And uh, it's also nice to mention that like, we, we did uh, hack this into uh, Spark ML. I didn't put it on GitHub because I'm uh, not necessarily uh, really proud. It's a bit ugly, but uh, yeah, it was fun to do. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the running example. So we calculate a score um, or a probability of, of booking and we find that it's high. And let's say we also have this whole thing implemented that we can calculate the contributions. Um, then, and, you also, and you find that the largest contribution is actually the number of distinct uh, pages. And that can lead to, the, to let's say, uh, show um, a summary or something like that. And then obviously, the customer is very happy because you made an, an app that, make the, that help, really helped them to book. Okay, so with that, I'm reaching uh, the end of my talk. So I hope that uh, you take away these three uh, take home messages. Most of all, like, how do you uh, make aggregate features uh, available? And I hope to talk to you about like, the trade off between uh, long and short uh, time windows. Also, like being exactly real time uh, or with a small lag. Um, and also talking about like high cardinality versus low cardinality. If you need to keep some features for all of your users, you might want to uh, consider uh, like data, um, database like Cassandra. And then on the model training and deployment, that's the, that's the, the big win. Having a Java code generated for you so that you can deploy it on your JVM. And then uh, the interpretation of individual scores, I think, is nice if you can not only say that the probability is high, but also why it is like that. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So now we're open to questions. So anyone has a question, I got Mike here. Oh, and we're hiring, by the way. <laughs> Data scientists and engineers. Uh, hello, uh, my, my question is, uh, when you're dealing with exactly th those two algorithms, uh, regression and random forest, yeah. uh, how do you deal with an imbalanced data set? What's your, your approach to it? With invalid? An imbalanced data set. For example, uh, you have a lot of one category and very few of another, uh, no. So, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that goes back to this slide here. So if you go and evaluate your, I think how I interpret this is like, how can you tell that it's a good model and like how do you deal with like uh, the evaluation of the model? Is that what you're asking or? Because like the, what, what we find is that yes, like just using accuracy to evaluate the, how good your model is, or if you just predicted that everything uh, is, is like one or everything's zero, then you might have a really high accuracy already, and so you're, you're more gonna look at actually, um, so, so in, in case of fraud, for example, you have very little fraud, and you want to just see them, right? So what you, what, what you really wanna balance there is the, the detection rate, so the recall, so out of the fraud, how much did you catch? And you wanna weigh that against the uh, false positive rate. So out of all of the good bookers, how many did you block? That's, that's, you, you, it's fine to block uh, bad bookers, but it's not good to uh, block uh, good bookers. So, um, yeah, in, in, that, uh, in that case, you're, you want to balance the false positive rate versus the, the recall. 
the AI curve that answers your question. And on the ROC curve, that's like uh, the, the, this corner, like the, the, the far left, uh, left end of the ROC curve. Hey, uh, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, I was wondering how do you deal with a user that is not logged in in terms of getting his history? Because personally, I have booked many hotels there and I've never logged in. I don't know if I should, but... No, that's, that's a, not a great question. So that's exactly why I used this it's example. Not. Because at booking, we don't really have users, uh, user IDs per se like that, right? Like, most people don't log in, okay. so you need to go with other things. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to give you like the whole uh, range of things that we look at because that's like our sort of secret sauce, right? But uh, sure. that's, there's m multiple ways in which you can identify users. Okay. This is a good question. Sure. And then a, a quick one, another one is uh, you're using this for uh, calculating the probability when the user is already in one hotel, but why not use that to sort the listings? The, this is just an example, right? Oh, okay. It's, it's, I mean, I, I wanted to take an example that's not very realistic. Okay. We, we, we may not want to, to do this. And, like, uh, yeah, and, and, and the ranking of hotels is definitely not a topic of this uh, sure. uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, any other question? Uh, excuse me, maybe I wasn't following uh, for the great talk. Uh, the training itself, did you use a Spark or use the HTO or? Uh, so that's, that's a good question. And uh, uh, if yeah. you use the Spark, uh, like, uh, can you give a little insight about uh, the parallelization, how, of course, you are dealing with very big amount of data and you want to train in a reasonable time? Uh, yeah, so let me put it here, right? This is the slide you're referring to. So yeah, I mean the the, the data munching we do with um, um, with Spark, and it's like exa it's exactly. I think this is a good visualization, right? You just keep going until you have like um, a set of features, and then you can use uh, Spark ML or H uh, 2 O for 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 training. Uh, so which one did you prefer, or did you, or uh, it's not allowed to say like which one you used? That's okay. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can talk about it afterwards. All right, so. offline. <laughs> Just a quick, quick comment. I think uh, when they started, I, I guess, it's, I never spoke with them, but my guess is back then, uh, the random forest, this type of uh, algorithm wasn't implemented in ML. It's new. Yeah, technology, I think they, when they started, they probably they just go with uh, Spark plus H2O, what do they call Sparkling H2O right yeah. now. So, so, yeah, but now uh, we have random forest implemented in, in, in our ML lab, if, feel free to use it. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, two, actually. One is um, practical, the other one is a theoretical. So in, on the practical side, how often do you actually retrain your model? Did you actually make it automated? Uh, system to do that, and on the theoretical side, is it really? Uh, that's a little bit surprising when I see you're using sort of like a total probability way of um, rank your features. So why not the typical or the classical way that um, Freeman came up with, just using out of back estimation of uh, errors to evaluate the features? You know. So the the first. The first question is how often do you actually have to yeah, retrain so, your model? Well, I, th I think you should find out yourself, right, like how often you need to retrain. Uh, but you could imagine, like, uh, doing it once a week or so. Yeah. Okay, fair enough, yeah. W what about the feature evaluation? Why you choose with the P uh, probability, like, so approach? I'm not, I'm not oh. entirely sure that the, oh, the other see. thing that you were that oh, mentioning. That's fine. We can follow up uh, offline. Yeah. Because in the random forest algorithm itself has this out of back approach to actually let you to rank. Yeah, I mean, I know rank. about yeah. like feature importance, but the, right. the, the key, if that's what you mean, like yeah. the, the, the typical uh, feature importance evaluation, the thing is that's a global thing, right? For every feature, you know how important it is. This is one prediction. For one prediction, you, like, for one leaf note, like, I, I make one prediction, I'm here. I'm not here, right? So, so now I, I went through this path, and so it's one prediction, one... 
Very good. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to get out of it. Yeah, yeah very good. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, we have another one. Yeah, I saw you have a slide that has timing uh, about running the register regression algorithms. I just wonder how many features did you choose for that? So, so for, first of all, this benchmark here is not my own. Um, I deliberately chose to like show uh, public domain uh, uh, benchmarks. Um, and you can see that here that there are 12 features. Nine of them are numerical. Uh, three of them are categorical, one billion rows. No, no, it's, 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 this, comes, this benchmark comes from uh, the data sheet that you can see under, underneath. Yeah. But we did, co we did confirm that we got similar numbers. It's just <laughs> uh, so you extract features from hotels and the users. Uh, what's your strategy uh, when the boat hotel and the user is new? You know, you don't know anything about hotel, uh, booking history of hotel, and the uh, booking history of a uh, user. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a nice question. So it's it, that's up to the data scientists, right? Like, how how are you going to deal with that? Maybe you can look at uh, bigger skills like country code, right? Or like the the country that someone's from. Um, or just if you really want like some something based, like well, what is the what, what is it now? Just the, the overall hotels. And surely you have those data, so you can always try to find like the. If you have one thing missing, you can try to find something else that you do have. All right, great. Uh, let's thank the speakers again. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs>